Some of you may know that song about the grace of God. I, 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 my mother used to sing that occasionally. I can, um, I can still hear her voice as he's saying, um, you know, that his grace is sufficient. And over and over again, he gives us that grace as we need it. What a wonderful reminder. I pr probably mellow because I've got a couple cousins here today. Usually they don't mellow me out. It's the other way around. But uh, really grateful to have them with us today. So that's who's on. We, we told them front row or nothing. And so there they are. And uh, so I hope you'll greet them afterwards. And uh, don't tell them anything that they don't need to know. But, uh, and don't ask them any questions because you may not like what you hear. Let's turn to Luke chapter 9, if you would please, with me. Luke 9, as we continue to look at this wonderful passage dealing with the transfiguration of Christ, passage that uh, to many of us was a mystery for years, maybe has always been kind of a little bit of a strange passage, but I hope we're beginning to understand what this is all about because it's such a tremendous revelation of so much of the message of Christ. I'm going to begin reading in verse 28 just for a couple of these verses, even though we read them each week. It says, now after about eight days after these things, he took them, he took with him Peter and James and John and went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we were here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Confederate uh, General Thomas Stonewall Jackson, very famous in history, by the way, a very devout believer, um, even though he was of Southern origin, but he came, to a, he came to a river one day toward the end of a day and instructed his engineers to go and plan and build a bridge so that they could get across. The wagon master who was with him began to collect stones and logs and uh, fence posts and whatever they could find that might help. The next morning, Jackson was up very early as he usually was and he looked and couldn't believe it. All the wagons were across the Artillery was all safely across the river. So he called the wagon master and he said, uh, great job. He said, where are the engineers? The wagon master said, well, they're still in their tent drawing up plans for a bridge. In the meantime, everybody else was across. It kind of reminded me that in many ways, they were planning a way over for something that had already been provided. And that's the way we are often with our Lord Jesus Christ. We're planning a way over when he's already provided a bridge to God that we could never build on our own in a million years. And that's what this passage is about. This passage, which seems so unworldly, is that way because it is unworldly. This is a kingdom preview, as we've seen in past weeks. It's a preview of what's going to be in the kingdom of God. We know that because in all three Gospels, just before this account, we're told that Jesus tells the disciples that some of them aren't going to see death before they see the kingdom. And Peter, James, and John are the three who are especially privileged to get this kingdom preview. It's a necessary preview because Jesus has announced that he, the Messiah, is heading toward death in Jerusalem. And they need to be encouraged that there's something beyond this. And so we saw, first of all, the first week we looked at the purpose of the preview, the purpose of the preview. And we saw that it was to encourage the disciples. They'd given up everything. They were now proclaiming, they just before this, Peter had proclaimed on behalf of all of them that Jesus is the Messiah. And now Jesus turns around and tells him, yeah, I'm the Messiah and I'm on my way to Jerusalem to die. How would you feel? 
You've given up everything to follow this guy, and now he's telling you that it's all going to be over with. They didn't know how to take it, but they needed encouragement. And so this was one way that they were greatly encouraged, that at the end, there's a reality that's coming. It's going to be greater than the pain to get there. It was a great encouragement to Jesus as well. In his earthly life, we know that he was already just here in a few weeks before the cross, it was really beginning to weigh on him. Not the physical pain and suffering that he was going to go through, but the becoming sin for all of us and the separation that was going to come from the Father. And so there's the purpose of the preview to be an encouragement to these. But now we want to look at the person of the preview. And last week we started that. and we, we looked at the supremacy of the person of Christ. He's the center point here. Supremacy of his person, supreme in his manhood, supreme in his majesty as God, and supreme in his message. Jesus is the one person in all of history who absolutely cannot be ignored. He's the person whose life has relevance to every other person. And so there's the supremacy of his person, but now we need to look today at his at his work, the su- sufficiency of his, <coughs> excuse me, the sufficiency of his passion, of his death, <coughs> excuse me, to see how his death is sufficient for the work that it's intended to do. And then the next couple of weeks, it's not the main point of the passage, but we're going to see what it teaches us about kingdom conditions. And there are some wonderful teachings there about what heaven is going to be like as we go through this. But today, the sufficiency of his passion. Jesus and Moses and Elijah have been talking about Jesus' coming departure in Jerusalem. Now, the disciples were asleep part of the time, but when they awoke, they quickly identified that Moses and Elijah are sitting there talking to Jesus, who has just, you know, completely lit up. His deity is showing through. And this whole scene would have absolutely screamed kingdom to them. They had already just the week before proclaimed that, yes, they understood that Jesus is the Messiah, the anointed one, the special one who was going to come, the son of the living God. They knew that Elijah was supposed to be coming before the kingdom. In Malachi 4, 5, the next to the last verse in the Old Testament, they knew it said, behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And so here they're seeing Jesus in his glory. They're seeing the prophet Elijah. They've just proclaimed that they know he's Messiah. And Moses is here almost like a bonus. This is the kingdom, man, and things are moving. If you think they weren't delighted at what was going on here, you don't understand what was in their mind. It's all coming together. Now, there is that little statement that Jesus keeps talking about, about death to come. But, you know, he is so deep. He does say things we don't understand. Don't quite get that. But, boy, the kingdom's coming. And they're ready to go. But now they turn around and suddenly Moses and Elijah are preparing to depart. And so Peter, never one to sit back, right? Decide, wait, 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 what? what? You, you, you can't leave. This is, this, is, this is all going well. We don't want this to be over with. And so in verse 33, it says, as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He didn't know what he was saying. The Bible acknowledges that. But what's he doing? He's trying to say, let, let's, let's, put something, let, let's put something here for you to reside in. Let's keep this going. We don't want to give this up. We don't know exactly what he had in mind, but we do know he's thinking he's seeing the kingdom, and now he's seeing it disappear. And he wants to hang on to this. And so he, d- he proposes to build these three dwellings. Now, Peter, as usual, is meddling in forbidden territory, right? He's, he, he's blown it in several different ways. The first is that, that he's proposing equal housing for all three men who are there, right? And as we saw last week, Jesus is by far and away, although these are two of the greatest men in Jewish history, he's by far and away superior to them. He's the one who is sinless. He's the one who all the things that Moses and Elijah started, he's going to fulfill them. He's going to complete them. He's the one who will make it all happen. You know, Peter's just kind of lumping them all together, saying, let's, let's just build three things. But, but even worse, 
He's repeating a previous error that is, is found in Matthew 16. And we've, we've talked about it previously, but you may want to just turn back there to see it in Matthew 16. Right after, this has been about a week before, right after they had proclaimed, or Peter had proclaimed, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and, G- and Jesus says, that's right, Peter, and, and, and the Father's the one who told you this. And then he says, and by the way, I'm going to Jerusalem to die. One of those things right on the heels of the other. And now in Matthew 16, verse 22, look what we see. Matthew 16, 22. He says, and Peter took Jesus aside after he said this about dying. And he began to rebuke him. He's just, he's just acknowledged that he's Messiah. And, and now he's taking upon himself to rebuke the one that he said is the anointed one of God. He began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me. You know, this is a strong rebuke. I don't know of a stronger rebuke, really, to a believer in the Bible than what happens here. But Jesus rebukes Peter because he's generated the idea Satan using him of bypassing the cross. It's not going to happen to you, Jesus. We're not going to let this happen to you. And Jesus is basically saying, that's Satan's idea, Peter. But here is Peter again in Luke 9 at the the Mount of Transfiguration, basically saying, hey, forget dying, man. Let's get on with the kingdom. He's a little more subtle about it this time, but that's effectively what he's doing. It's another attempt to have the crown without the cross. And this happens to Peter because he so little understands at this point in time what redemption is all about. Now God the Father steps in here and he ends the heresy very quickly. Makes that statement, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. Indelibly telling who's in charge here, which is not Peter, but Peter didn't yet understand the necessity of the cross to pay for his own sins, let alone for the sins of others. And yet that's the theme. That's the theme of this whole passage Look at it in verse 30. It says, And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, his departure which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So the subject is Jesus' coming substitutionary death. That's what the word departures we saw last week means. Now, notice it's a death that he's about to accomplish. That's strange language, is it not? We don't usually think of death as something we accomplish. It's something that happens to us, but not something that we would consider an accomplishment by us. But see, Jesus' death is different. Jesus' death has a purpose, and his purpose is to accomplish redemption. The purpose of Jesus' death is to destroy death as we see in Hebrews 2. The purpose of Jesus' death is to take the fangs out of death, and if he doesn't go there, there's no end to death. Jesus' death had all been prophesied for hundreds of years, right? It was there in the Bible many times and they just didn't see it. Isaiah 53, verses 5 and 6, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds we are healed. Do you see the language? Is such a, there's no doubt about the substitu- substitutionary nature of the atonement of Christ here. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've all turned every one his own way and the Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's where Jesus was going. That's why he had to go to Jerusalem. That's why Peter stepping in was so awful. He was trying to stop the very thing that would save himself. Jesus says in John chapter 10, verses 17 and 18, He said, for this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down. I have authority to take it up again. This, now listen to this, this charge I have received from my Father. 
Jesus was just doing the will of the Father. He was going to do what the Father had asked him to do and what he had agreed to do, and he had to go. Peter speaks of our salvation later. He finally got it. 1 Peter 1, verses 18 through 20, he says, knowing that you were, rede- you were ransomed by the, from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things, such as silver or gold. You can't buy your way in. But with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world. Listen, the idea of the death of Christ didn't originate with the Pharisees, beloved. It originated with God the Father as the only means to redeem a fallen fallen race. The death of Christ was prophesied. It was planned. It was purposeful. It was pivotal. The death of Christ was anything but a tragic accident. It was that which was required we were ever going to have salvation. And so he was going to accomplish redemption. Had to go to Jerusalem to do that by his death, by his resurrection, by his ascension. All of those are form part of his departure. The emphasis in the word departure is on his death, but the resurrection and the ascension also are part of that package. Imagine how this visit from Moses and Elijah would have encouraged the human Jesus as he heads toward there. Now, Luke uses a dramatic play on words here. We haven't mentioned it before, but we'll mention it today and spend a little time on this. See, the word departure, they were talking about the departure of Christ. It's literally, the Greek word is the word exodus. Sound familiar? It was intended to sound familiar. What Luke is doing is pointing us to the fact that what Jesus is going to do in Jerusalem is in some way connected to what Moses, who's also sitting there on the mountain, did years ago, bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. It was an exodus. And now there's going to be a new exodus. And just as Jesus brought, just as Moses brought the people from a physical, delivered them from a physical enslavement in Egypt, Jesus is going to to accomplish a spiritual exodus in Jerusalem for those who will believe and who will follow him. The tie-in here is very purposeful. It's what we'd call, from a biblical perspective, a Bible type, or I like the word pattern. What you'll find as you study the Bible is that God often in history uses patterns. He uses things in people that happened in ancient times to point to something even greater that's going to happen later. And the whole Exodus story in the book of Exodus is pointing us forward to a greater Exodus, to this spiritual Exodus that Jesus is going to accomplish in Jerusalem. Jesus is the greater, the ultimate Exodus that Moses was always pointing to. He's the all-sufficient bridge to the Father. He's the only way over, beloved. And so he had to go to Jerusalem. Do you see why he was so intent on that? And why Peter was so wrong to try and stop him? Now, with the idea in mind that these two exoduses are related to each other and that they're connected, I want to do this. I want to point out four areas, four things, four commonalities, if you will, to these two exoduses, the exodus of Moses and the exodus of Christ. First point of comparison, both were initiated by God. Both were initiated by God. Those of you who know your Old Testament history will remember that the Israelites, the children of Israel, the children of Jacob were in Egypt in the first place because Joseph, Abraham's great-great-grandson great had moved the whole clan down there when there was a great famine that went on in the land. But after a while, Joseph passed away, and the first thing that happened, a pharaoh arrived on the throne who didn't know Joseph, according to the Bible, and the children of Israel became slaves in Egypt for 400 years. That's a long time. That's twice as long as the United States has been a nation, right? They were slaves in Egypt for 400 years. Now, then he sent along this guy named Moses. And you may recall, Moses tried under his own power 
to get the children of Israel released. And all he did was cause a problem. So God sent him out on the backside of the desert for 40 years. Sometimes God has to put us through wilderness years to get where he wants to take us, right? 40 years, Moses was on the backside of the desert herding sheep, but then God sent him to Pharaoh, now under the power of God to provide this great deliverance from the greatest nation on earth at the time. Had God not taken the initiative, there would have been no exodus from Egypt. You see, the same is true in the human family. We're in bondage, the Bible tells us, to sin and to death. The Bible says in Romans 3.10, none is righteous. No, not one. But it's worse than that. It says no one understands. Not only are we sinners and we can't help it, and we just keep doing the things we don't want to do, but we don't understand, and then it's even worse. No one seeks for God. That's how bad our bondage is. Do You see that we're in, we're in bondage to sin, and we don't even want to get out. Now, I know some people pride themselves, and you'll hear people talk about this, that they're seeking God. But what the Bible teaches is that we're not seeking the God of the Bible. We're seeking a God of our own making. We're seeking a God who will excuse us. We're seeking a God who is easy to control. We're seeking a God of our own making. That's because of the guilt that's within us. And we realize, consciously or unconsciously, that we're guilty and we want to get rid of the guilt. So we want to create a God who will be kind and who will be generous and who we can control and who will only go as far as we think he should go. But when people come face to face with the God of the Bible who is in the, in the words of Hebrews 12, 29, who is a consuming fire in his holiness and demands in his accountability that we be just as perfect as he is, we run. We run from him. We don't run toward him. And so unless God takes the initiative, there is no exodus from our sin and our guilt. But... God takes the initiative. Thank God God takes the initiative. That's why we can sing about grace, right? Tim Keller tells a story. It's a, it's, a, it's a great story about a woman in his congregation who once complained to a friend of hers. She said, you know, <clears throat> God help me. She says, I've been praying over and over. God help me to find you. And she said, but nothing happens. I, I, I just don't seem to be able to find God. And her friend suggested, listen, why don't you change the prayer just slightly? Why don't you say this? Why don't you say, God, I am a lost sheep, and you are the good shepherd. Would you come and find me? And the woman who's telling Keller this story, she said, I can, she said, the only reason I can tell you this story is because that's what I did, and that's what he did. He came and found me. Beloved, I wish I, could, I wish I had time to share with you the stories, many of them from our own church, of people who have come to the end of themselves and how God has found people who were once on the run, running away from him, many, some, some of them denying his existence. When the moment came when they got tired of living, trying to find themselves in things and in pleasures and in whatever else, and their lives were messed up, addictions, whatever, when they cried out to God, that in some cases they didn't even believe in, God reached them. It's all by grace. It's all because God initiates it. There's no salvation apart from grace. We have a great God. And He seeks us. Second comparison I see here is that both provide release by grace. Not only does God initiate the action, but the whole process is by grace. What that means is it's all, what does grace mean? It means unmerited favor. It means something we could never earn. It means we can't build the bridge ourselves. And so what, is, what happens? God builds the bridge. He not only reaches to us, but he built the bridge in the person of Christ by grace. He provided the solution. Let's, let's turn back to Exodus. I'm going to spend a few minutes back there in Exodus chapter 3. 
And then we'll go to a little bit later chapter. But in Exodus chapter 3, as we're talking about this original Exodus from Egypt, Exodus 3, verses 7 and 8. It says, the Lord, then the Lord said, this is to Moses at the burning bush. He's at the burning bush now as he's calling him after his 40 years of herding sheep. The Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians. Do you see that it's all by grace? God doesn't say they came up. God says, I came down. Why did you come down, Lord? I came down to deliver them. I came down to deliver. I'm the one who has come. Moses, you know what? Mo what did Jesus say? I came to seek and to save the lost, right? Luke 19. 10, the theme of the book of Luke that we're going through. Moses' message to, from God to Pharaoh was constantly what? Let my people go. He came down to deliver them. You look at Exodus 4 through 10, nine times you'll find that phrase, let my people go. And Pharaoh holds out, but in the end, God wins. See, because God accomplished his purpose of redemption. The exodus of Moses was an amazing thing. It was unbelievable that one guy could walk in there and take that many people out of the most powerful nation on earth and they didn't want it, but it pales by comparison to the deliverance that Jesus offers us from our spiritual bondage. It pales by comparison. Once again, the Lord came down, this time becoming part of his own creation, right? He came one of us. He came to deliver. And this time it's no temporary deliverance from a, from a slavery, as bad as that is physically. It's a permanent deliverance from a physical, from a spiritual slavery. Jesus Exodus, Jesus Exodus breaks the chains of sin, break, breaks the hold that the world, the flesh and the devil have on us, and it bridges the gap that we have between us and an infinitely holy God. That's what the exodus of Jesus is all about. And as God persisted in the task in Egypt until it was done, Jesus persisted in the task on earth until it was done. He set his face toward Jerusalem, we're told in Luke 9, 51. He was absolutely determined, as hard as this was going to be, from a physical standpoint, from his human standpoint, it was going to be done. But now... We have to understand one thing, and we'll, we'll emphasize it again before we get done here, but you have to understand that providing, because a lot of people miss this, providing, providing deliverance is different from accepting deliverance, okay? Providing deliverance is different from accepting deliverance. God provided through Moses for the children of Israel, the possibility of deliverance. But listen, they had to get up and move, right? They had to act in faith to move out, to follow the direction that God had given. Unfortunately, many refuse the deliverance that Jesus has provided in his exodus. So many people. They refuse to admit that they are in bondage. Many people are like, they're, they're like the guy that, you know, the cop pulled him over said, sir, don't you realize you're going the wrong way on a one-way street? The guy said, oh, yeah, I didn't notice. He says, but, you know, I, I don't think it's my fault. He said, I, I turned onto this street off of Maple, and I'm telling you, I was looking. There was no sign there to warn me that this is a one-way street. And the cop just looked at him, shook his head. He said, hey, listen, you were going the wrong way on Maple, too. You're just on one-way streets going the wrong direction the whole time. You're on, you know what Jesus' words would be? You're on the broad way going the wrong way. People wonder why their lives are messed up. People wonder why there's no real lasting happiness. People wonder why the things that they're looking to for joy and peace just bring the opposite. You know, any counselor will tell you behind every counseling issue, there's unconfessed, unadmitted, 
unresolved sin. It's just the way life works. We're enslaved to sin. The Bible tells us that. Romans 6, verse 16 says, Paul says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves as to anyone as obedient slaves, you're slaves to the one to whom you obey? Either, he doesn't leave a third option. He says, either to sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. Now, I, I know we all feel like we're independent contractors. We feel like we can kind of make our own way. We get to make a decision. We can follow this little angel over here. We can follow this little angel over there. We can just cut a swath down the middle and be our own God. And the Bible is saying, no, 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 no. You're either serving Christ or you're serving sin. It's one of the two. There's no middle ground here. And the reason we can't see that is why? Because the Bible says because our eye, we're blind. We're spiritually blind. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, and. In their case, he's speaking of the unbelievers there in Corinth, in their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of Christ. Listen, beloved, the gospel that you're hearing this morning is intended by God to light you up. To bring understanding to a mind that doesn't, hasn't gotten it yet. But you can't continue to just go your own way. That has to be Christ's way ultimately if we're going to have deliverance. So we have to accept the gift. The, the deliverance has been provided. It's by grace that it's provided, but we have to accept it. Third thing here, both of these deliverances require a substitutionary payment. Both of them require a substitutionary payment. Deliverance is not free. It's a free gift to us, as we've learned in Romans 6.23, but there's a great cost that attaches to it. You know, I, we, here's part of our blindness. I, I would imagine we've all been there. I, I know I certainly have. The first time you steal the cookie, what? You're just, I mean, you're just waiting for lightning to strike, right? In some form. You know, you know, mom's got eyes in the back of her head and here it's going to come or something. Or God, just God's going to see it. And, you know, and, then, and then what happens? So you get the cookie and eat it and it tastes good and nothing happens, right? So, so you convince yourself, well, maybe this isn't quite the way I thought it was. I, I can sin and get away with it. At least the little things. And before long, we're, we're, turning, we're, we're, we're turning our own way constantly, constantly, constantly thinking I can get away with this. And, and what we're not realizing is that behind the scenes, every single sin, not just the big ones, beloved, but the little ones and all of them, the thoughts that are sinful, the actions that are sinful, the attitudes that are sinful, they all have to be paid for. In the end, they all have to be paid for and accounted for. God runs a precise universe. And the teaching of the word of God is that the, 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 the sin is either paid for by us who do it, by an eternal separation from God, or it's paid for by the Son of God on the cross on our behalf. It's one of the two. Yeah, you can get away with it for a while. Lightning doesn't strike right away. But payday is coming. So sin has to be paid for. And with every plague back there in Egypt, Pharaoh kept promising release. Remember that? But then he would always renege on the promise until finally God absolutely lowered the boom on the 10th plague. On the 10th plague. Let's, let's do, if you're still in Exodus, turn to chapter 11. This was the one that finally got through. Exodus 11. This is a plague that had tragic and, and lasting effect. So let's start in, I don't know, verse 4. So Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I will go out in the midst of Egypt, and every firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the handmill. Keep in mind, that is an Israelite girl, right? And all the firstborn of the cattle, everybody, firstborn of everybody, firstborn of every kind, 
firstborn of the Egyptians, firstborn of the Israelites, the firstborn of everybody are from that moment forward under a sentence of death. See, with God, with sin, there's no, there's no, there's no favoritism. There's no preference. There's no preferential treatment. We look at, you know, we, we have this tendency to look at this deliverance from Egypt and say, oh, yeah, yeah, the Egyptians are the bad guys, Israel's the good guys, and so God gets them out of there. Wrong. They're all bad guys. They're all sinners. They're all under sentence of death when the death angel is about to come. You see that? It's everybody is under sentence of death. God is no respecter of persons when it comes to sin. Family background, ethnic background, being American instead of Muslim makes no difference. The sin of every person must be accounted for. And so it is in Egypt. And so when Moses announces this is what's going to happen, everybody's under a death sentence. But here's where the substitutionary atonement comes into play, right? In Exodus 12. Now God's going to come along and say, I've got, but I've got a provision. And by the way, the provision isn't just be really good between now and the time that the angel of death passes through. That doesn't turn out to be the provision. It's not, well, if I look back at your history and your character and you've really done a great job and you've done more good than you've done bad, then you're released. That's not it. We all know what the provision is, right? Look at it, Exodus 12, verse 12. And this is the message to the Egyptians as well as the Israelites. God says, for I will pass through. Notice the wording, I will pass through. Hang on to that. I will pass through the land of Egypt that night and I will strike the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and in all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I, dest- when I strike the land of Egypt. Notice that God passes through the whole land. What's the message there? He knows everything. He misses nothing. I'm going to pass through. And I'm going to see everything there is to see. I'm going to pass through the whole land. But I will pass over. (laughs) Wonderful message, isn't it? I'll pass over. I won't execute the, conduct, the, the, the sentence of death where I see the blood. It's not where the people are really good and these are bad and so I kill the bad ones and I let the good ones go. No, 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 no. When I see the blood, that's where I'll pass over. And beloved, listen, Egyptians could have put the blood on their doorposts just like the Israelites could put the blood on their doorposts. God's no respecter of persons. Now we know that basically it was the Israelites who believed in this God who did that, but it was available to everyone. And so God passed over, but it was only on the basis that there was a substitute, there was a lamb killed to take the place of the firstborn who would have been killed. Substitutionary atonement is what we call that. It means there was a sacrifice. It means somebody took your place. And that somebody in the exodus of Jesus Christ was, of course, Jesus Christ himself. Now notice Exodus, just turn back to Exodus 11 and look at verse verse 14. Because Jesus gives a further instruction about this. Exodus 11 and verse 14, it says, This day, this Passover, I'm I'm sorry, it's not Exodus 14, it's Exodus 11, it's Exodus 12, verse 14. This day shall be for you a memorial and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. How long? Throughout your generations. And so what happened? For the next 1,400 years after God gave that commandment, that's exactly what happens. Passover, the feast of Passover, 
was the celebration of, rec of the recognition of the mercy and the grace of God in delivering the people from Israel, right? And, and sparing their firstborn who were under condemnation of death by means of a substitutionary sacrifice. And now here we are on the Mount of Transfiguration 1,400 years later, and Moses and Elijah and Jesus are discussing a new exodus, a new exodus. This year, probably 30 A.D., Passover is going to be different. Now listen, the people are still going to go. The Jewish people are still going to come from all over the country and they're going to sacrifice lambs and they're going to sacrifice uh, goats until the blood's going to flow down into the river Kidron and it's going to be red from the blood of the sacrifices of the temple just like it has every year for 1,400 years. That's all going to happen. But just outside the walls of Jerusalem this year, the sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice, the only one that ever really counted, the one that all these others pointed forward to, that sacrifice is going to happen. And Jesus Christ is going to become the sacrifice for his exodus, the exodus which he would lead for all who will believe in him. In Jesus' exodus, there's not lamb after lamb after lamb, there's one lamb, and it's him. Hebrews 10 verse 4 reminds us what this is all about. It says, for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. That's why we've said in these past weeks, Moses and Elijah themselves are in heaven on credit. They're only here because of the looking forward to the death of Christ. The death of Christ doesn't happen. They're gone from heaven. Because the blood of bulls and goats that they have sacrificed to show their faith could not take away their sins. They hadn't been taken away yet and cleansed, but now they will be. Now listen to this comments. I'm just going to read you a few comments that Scripture teaches about the death of Christ as opposed to the blood of bulls and goats. Listen to this. Romans chapter 6, verse 10. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. Once for all. Hebrews 7, verse 27. He has no need like those high priests to offer sacrifices daily. First for his own sins, which the priest had to do, and then for the sins of the people, since he did this once for all. When? When he offered himself up. Hebrews 9, verse 12, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood. Thus securing eternal salvation. Just like in Moses' time, God came down and God delivered. And beloved, it's, it's, it's popular today in the emergent church evangelical circles to say there was no substitutionary atonement. It was just a great example. Steve Chalk, who claims to be a Christian just like you and I do, sits in churches just like you and I do, and his emergent Friends tell us that the substitutionary atonement makes God out to be a cosmic child abuser. It's a lie. The red thread of substitutionary atonement flows through the Bible from Genesis 3.15 to Revelation 22. You can't have a Bible without substitutionary atonement. It's the heart of everything. And it has nothing to do with what we do. It has everything to do with what Jesus did. And if we ever grasp what the grace of God has done for us, it changes your life. It makes you a different person. You can't be the same person again once you really get this. Do you see it? The only thing we do is accept it, but the, but the Bible tells us God even gives it. That's even a gift of grace faith to accept it. Fourth thing, both releases are obtained by faith. This is obvious by now, but just to press the point for just one second, it wasn't enough that the lamb died. In the exodus of Moses, you could kill the lamb, the lamb could lay there, and if the blood wasn't applied, what happened? Death. What's the point? The point is 
that the death of the sacrificial animal didn't mean anything until the blood was applied by faith. And the same applies to the death of Christ. Christ died objectively, atonement is provided. Objectively, redemption is paid. The price is paid. But until you and I apply the blood, there's no salvation. But once we do, once we accept that sacrifice as ours, it covers every, every, every single sin and the, and the grace of Jesus just flows and flows and flows. So that we get that wonderful passage in Romans, Romans 5.20 that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. You can't out sin the grace of God. But here's the thing, once it's applied, you won't want to out sin the grace of God. Be a changed person. He's the only way over, beloved. Years ago, I worked, when I, was, when I started college, I started working at a, uh, at a place called Autonetics. It was, a, it, was a, it was an aerospace outfit in Anaheim, California, where we lived at the time. And the first thing that happened, because we worked on a lot of, uh, a lot of government projects there, is I had to go through the whole process of getting a secret clearance. And I'm telling you, I was 18 years old at the time, and still, what you had to go through to get a secret clearance was amazing. They wanted to know everything you ever did, thought, whatever else. So I got the secret clearance. And then you had to have a badge, and you had to have, a, you had to have an ID card that you had to show every time you came in the gate of that place, because it was secured, right? And so every day we'd come in, usually wore a badge in the pocket, and you showed, you showed the ID card as you went through. Being a cocky 18-year-old kid, dumb. Um, uh, about, about the time I'd been there for a year, I said to another guy, I said, you know what, I'll bet I could get in without showing that ID card. He said, no, nah, no, nah, you can't do that. I said, uh, you, you, you meet me out at the parking lot tomorrow, and we'll come in, and, I, and I'll show you I can get in without showing that ID card. And so the next morning, we met out there. I pulled out my driver's license, which looked something like the ID card. I let him walk in first. I walked in right behind him, went, walked right on through. So he said, okay, so you can do it. He said, Bob, you can't do it again. I said, I'll bet I can do it for 30 days in a row. And I did it for 30 days in a row. Got into that highly secured, highly protected security plan, 30 days in a row without ever showing my identification. But beloved, here's the point. The kingdom of God didn't like that. You can't get in there by your own effort. You can't get in there by your own clever schemes. God doesn't want to see anything you have to offer, nothing. There's only one way in, and that's through Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He's the only way over. I hope you know him. If you know him, I hope you're living in the good of what you have by the grace of God. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these reminders. We thank you for this wonderful day when we could celebrate your table. Lord, this one day, I see Doris back there, this one day when we can celebrate that our brother Paul this past week has arrived in glory. What a, what a thought that is to be worshiping today with you. Thank you for the kids and the adults who went to reach camp for the work that they did to show the love of God to some people who were in desperate need. We have much to be thankful for. But most of all, Father, we have to be thankful that Jesus Christ, in his exodus, provided the way to the Father. Lord, if there's anyone here who hasn't just by faith accepted that gift, I just pray that this morning, even right now, they just open their heart to you. I pray that they would say, you know what, I, I'm tired of going my own way. I'm, I'm ready to turn and repent of my sin and give my heart to Christ. I do that right now. I want my life to be different. I want Jesus to be my Savior. Thank you, Father. Thank you for all that you've provided. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.